One benefit of it from the user space side is that if you are using syslocal, it is part of POSIX. So you can depend on it being there, not just on Linux, but on other systems as well. Um, that's pretty much all it's going for, in my opinion. Um, I mean, a lot of people would say that because you can use graph in the plain text files, this somehow makes these things a lot easier to consume. There is an element of truth in that, um, and that you know it follows the Unix tradition of everything being as simple as, as at least you know as unuseful as possible. But um, we can actually do best than that nowadays. Um, of course, the drawback is, as I've said, these are just text files quite often. Um, you can't actually pass them as a machine very easily. People have tried, and you can get a certain amount of the way there, but not all the way. Um, because there is no standard format, you have quite a lot of problems. Um, for instance, if you're logging and the time zone changes, or if you're logging and you go through a leap second or something, how do you know that what is actually being given to the logging daemon has the right time stamp on it? Um, you can't verify a lot of these fields if they're just in the plain text file. So you can't in many cases. You also can't verify the sender of the message. So if you install a rootkit on the system, and you just sent a lot of messages to the logging daemon with syslog, and you decided to, to fake your PID, um, you could do that and get away with it in most cases. Um, and it's very difficult to then afterwards trace that. Um, ordering of messages is not guaranteed. Um, that's kind of annoying because if you get several different processes logging, um, and say one of them beats the other one, you get these logs that are interleaved that seem rather confusing, and you know, why did this failure happen? Or this thing where apparently this succeeded. It, it's just confusing if you're actually then trying to diagnose something after the fact. Of course, like everything, system D fixed it. Um, so, with uh, system D, very, very early on, um, there was the idea of the journal. Um, this is a demon, system D journal D, that has actually started at very, very early on during the boot. Um, it started so early that it, it sort of hoovers up the uh, kernel of messages that have currently been output um, and it then persists through um, to the, the real um, route once you actually get to that point um, the full system uh, and uh, then flushes all of those logs to disk so that from very very early on you've actually got all of those log messages um, on your system so even if something happens in early boot you can generally figure out what the problem is. Um, something that a lot of um, people who've uh, been involved in Unix for a very long time and maybe have long beards, um, they, they don't like the fact that this is a binary logging format. Um, I mean, if you ever open one of these files in hexos or something, it's binary in the sense that you've got lots of binary data fields in there, and, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's a, a file, but on the other hand, you have the message fields in there. If you, if you were worried about there being data loss, um, the files themselves are actually pretty robust, and you can go in there and open it and figure out what these text, what these uh, text messages, uh, of these log events are. Um, so I don't think that's of particular concern. One benefit of this binary logging format is you can do a lot more with it. Um, you can put all of your logs into one file, so all the logs from the kernel, the system demons from uh, the user session, and you can put all of those in one file, or at least you can put them in one file format. Um, so that you have a consistent way to access the information about those logs. Um, not only that, but you also have an API to push information to the logs. So whereas the syslog API is, is essentially one function call, where you say, um, I have this particular log message, it's got this particular severity or priority, I think is actually the terminology. Um, that's pretty much all you can do. Um, with the systemd journal APIs, you can add essentially any arbitrary metadata that you like. If you want to push a binary blob into the journal, you can do that. Um, that doesn't immediately sound useful, but on the other hand, um, say you have a crash, you want to put a core dump in there, then you can then access that much later on, um, and you can do some debugging, and it's in your logs directly. You know when it occurred, in you know which process it, it, it occurred on. Um, very, very useful. Uh, and of course, because there are APIs to put data in, as you'd expect, there are also APIs to get this information out. Um, and that means that rather than every logging client or UI having to pass this text file or this multitude of text files um, in its own way, we have one interface, one API for this. Um, and it's quite nice. 
Um, of course, GNOME already had, or has, or did at one point have, um, a logging UI, uh, GNOME system log. Um, and a lot of you may have used this in, in the GNOME 2 days. It's, um, it's quite a useful application, actually. I, I did use it occasionally. Um, it basically gave you a list of all of the different log files that it found on your system, based on some predefined list of where these files might be. Um, and then we'll just give you a big text view of this. Um, and I mean, I guess that kind of demonstrates the weakness of this approach that essentially all you've got is the big blog text. Um, you could go find things in this with a search tool and things like that. But other than that, um, it wasn't super advanced because it, it's very difficult really to have something so unstructured and to make something useful out of it. Um, as well as having uh, this sort of quite retro UI, which is basically just a a sidebar with a tree view and a text view on the right hand side. Um, one of the things it had to do to access a lot of these log files was run in root because these files are actually uh, generally owned by the root users and not readable to other users. Um, this is kind of a problem because various things break in that situation. Obviously, running GTK applications as a root generally is frowned upon. Um, and then things like the app menu didn't work because it couldn't connect to the session bus. So, it was a bit of a difficult one to fix. Um, and I think the idea was really to have something new and something different. Um, so this is what it looked like, and yeah, it's pretty much what you'd expect. It's a very um, traditional log viewing application. Um, and then the idea for a new logging UI came around, um, no logs. Um, this is based on original designs that uh, John McCann made uh, quite a while ago. Um, he investigated a lot of different approaches to logging. Um, he looks at a lot of platforms, so uh, Windows has a kind of similar idea to the journal. It has this, this system logging service that you can push logs into. Um, Mac OS has a kind of better log viewer, um, but a lot of them still don't really take full advantage of the fact that you have this useful API, um, and they don't use that to actually simplify what you're presenting to the user. Um, and that was really kind of the, the approach that he took to really condense things down as much as possible and only show the problems that were most important, the problems that actually the user needed to pay attention to. I mean, they could get access to the other things that they wanted, but by default, it would only give you the, the severe warnings, the ones that you needed to worry about. Um, so I started quite a while ago, September 2013 um, was the first release. It was already somewhat functional then. I mean, you've got a list of log items. You, uh, you can click on them, you can get more details. Um, one of the nice things about it was because it was a new project, Although it's written in C, because a lot of the system the APIs are in C, and it just seemed easier to do that. Um, it was kind of a nice um, idea to just play with the new technology that we had in GDIP and GTK. Um, so you know, we used like widget templates and GResource when these things were still uh, relatively new. Um, that was quite fun. It's, it's because it's quite small. It's also something that's relatively easy to handle. Um, and I mean, I think it's only uh, it's, it's only sort of five ten thousand lines of code. It's far more small. See. Um, and this is pretty much how it looked. This was relatively close actually to the original designs. Um, it's changed now, I'll give another screenshot later. But you've got this list of categories on the left, um, and by default we have important selected. So important is essentially the log messages that are more severe, I can't remember, I think it's warning severity or higher, or error severity or higher, something like that. These are based on like the, the traditional syslog priorities of these messages. Um, You'll still see that some of those messages there are kind of useless. So like we have the abort daemon saying, an init complete entry main loop. Well, it doesn't really sound like a very important log message. Um, it's just starting up. That's just debug skew really. Um, and there are a few accounts of that. But that's actually, the situation there has improved. Um, and a lot of those messages have now been dropped down to less severe warnings. Um, but you can already see, it's, you know, there's, there's a decent UI forming there. It looks like a known free application. You've got your header bar, you've got um, a search toggle there. Um, it actually has type ahead find. And these were essentially all of the features that um, were in the initial designs. Um, so filtering by category sort of works. Um, one of the nice things about the journal is you can actually figure out um, where the messages come from. So you can say, I only want to view the messages that are coming from the kernel transport. And it will only show you those things that you would normally get in dmessage. You can say, I'm only interested in processes that this user has started. And it will give you those. Um, so because you've actually got kind of a rich filtering and matching API, um, you can already implement a lot of those categories with very, very different code, just sort of a, almost a one-line match rule. Um, 
um, that's pretty pretty neat. It's a lot easier than it would have been with a text file and a regex. There's a detailed message view which I didn't show you there. You can click on a particular blog item and it will reveal more information about that, that particular message. Basically all the metadata that we, we pull out of the journal for it. But you can actually pull a lot more metadata out of the journal than, than, than Logs does. Um, it didn't seem like a particularly good approach to just get everything you can and present it in the UI. I mean, that by itself isn't useful. If you want to do that, I mean, the journal CTL is a very capable tool. Um, this is just something that you know, shows you a few more things than maybe you can or would want to in a list. Um, type head search works as you would expect. So what happened after that time? Um, well, John didn't have a great deal of time uh, to work on it. Um, so there wasn't a great deal of, of sort of UI changes. There were little features out here and there. I got lots of nice bike reports from, from new users who were kind of interested and who said, oh, well, you know, the, the sorting is in the wrong direction, so maybe there could be a toggle for that. So I kind of hidden G set for that because uh, a lot of users actually expect their logging to be much like it would in a text file that you append new things to the end. And we actually did it the opposite way. We had important messages and, and new messages especially bubble to the top. Um, but some of you still expect it the old way. That's something that's easy to satisfy. Um, and then after that, um, there was a sort of little things. But Lars uh, came along um, and uh, we were chatting uh, about improving GK list box um, at the development experience hackers. Um, and him and Ryan Lawrence have been coming up with this idea to have a model behind GTK list box. So GTK list box, if you're not aware, is the sort of modern GTK replacement for most uses of GTK uh, tree view. So way you use tree view for a list of items, um, you're not really using it as a tree view, you're using it in a, in a sort of very simplified case. And a lot of the time you want something more than the tree view can provide. You want something where you can add buttons or some other proper widget tree to each row um, because you're limited with a, with a tree view with cell renders. It, it, it's kind of a, uh, very good if you have tabular data, not really so good if you have anything else. Um, <coughs> we were starting to have more interesting things there. So we, we actually wanted to use GTK this box. We did. Um, we had some extra widgets there. We wanted to then put a model behind it because otherwise for each row you have to worry about creating all of these widgets yourself and things. and it's really something that we'd like the API to do for us. Um, so uh, Lars put in a lot of work to uh, the list model itself um, and, and looks at logs a lot. Um, and I think it was one of the first users of it. It was kind of this prototype really while he was uh, developing it with Ryan. Um, eventually that work got merged into uh, GLib and basically as soon as there was a release there, I could depend on logs. And I did, and I think, I can't remember that. I think that was like the last cycle. So uh, sort of 316, we, uh, we have all that coming in. And that's really cool. Uh, one of the other nice things that allowed us to do is to do on-demand loading. So what it, what logs would previously do is it would take the current boot up and it would give you all the log messages for that. Um, this is fine if, of course, you know you work with Red Hat and they give you a nice new laptop and it has an SSD. It's really fast. Um, but then what you find is that if you use the journal on some old rotating disk, then actually it's kind of slow to use a match rule and go through and iterate over <coughs> all these log items. Um, so that was actually kind of too slow and too annoying. Um, so with the new um, signals that you now have in uh, GTK scroll window, you can actually tell when you get to the bottom uh, or the top of this list and you can then page in extra items. Um, so he did that and that was, that was kind of a, a simple patch really when it came down to it, but those features up here in GTK we made use of them. So that's now a lot more responsive. Um, we also used to load, I think, items in blocks of 10, which again, if you're on an SSD, isn't a problem. It now just loads each individual item as soon as it's required, creates a widget tree on demand, um, and it's pretty fast. I mean, I'm sure it could be faster, um, but currently everything's done at the main thread, so it's about as good as it can get, I think, at the moment. Something really exciting that's happened this year is that we've had two summer of code students um, working on logs. So Jonathan Kang and uh, Rashi Azwani, they've both been, um, they've actually both been involved in Gnome for a while, so Jonathan came to me um, pretty much a year ago, I guess, um, so I think he was interested in working on some applications and what could I, you know, what could I help them with. And I said, oh well, I've got this small application I'm developing, um, it's kind of nice and small and probably a good introduction to Gnome technologies if you want to you know, have a play with it. 
Um, he started to make some really nice patches. So um, I then, after you know, a few of these really good patches, and, and going through and reviewing those and mentoring him with those, said, well, you should apply for a summer code credit. Um, you know, just running and you're a student, it'll be fun. Um, he did, um, and he's been actually doing some really, really good work there. He gave a presentation at the Intense Lightning Talks, which you may have seen. Um, he's been working on some really, really awesome features. So we've now got um, searching by journal fields. So each of the metadata items that you store in the journal, it has these particular fields attached. You can now actually prefix your search term with those, so that you restrict that search term to those fields. Um, it's a really, really cool feature. It currently, it's just a subset that we have that we pull out of the journal. Uh, but we're going to be extending that to all of the metadata fields that we have in the journal um, as an enhancement later on. So you've been working on loads of other stuff as well, and blogging about it a lot of time later, so that's good. Rashi's doing some really, really great work on the testing. Um, so not only has she been looking at unit tests um, and the framework that we're using there, she's actually been writing lots of really cool uh, UI tests and, and behavioral tests she's using Behave and Dogtown. Um, so she was previously a documentation intern, and she's now kind of graduated, if you like. She's now doing a lot of documentation, she's now hacking on logs. Um, and uh, it's been it's been quite difficult. I mean, the test stuff is always a little bit of a difficult thing to set up. I find, especially if you know, you're like me and you've done recursive make, and then you want to somehow get all of the test suite into there. But she's managed to deal with that really, really well. Um, and uh, very proud of both my students of winning really well. So I think they deserve that. Thank you. So this is how, actually how Rob's looks now. It looks quite a bit uh, slim down. Um, so this is based on some really good work that Alan Day has been doing um, with more recent designs. We've sort of simplified the, uh, the list view a lot. Um, that's actually, um, this is based on like, some recent refactorings. He's uh, actually provided us some new designs, so we're gonna slim this down a bit more and uh, change a few things here. I think everything is now gonna be monospace fonts, um, just so it's consistent uh, on, the, on the event view that you have on the right. We've also slipped down some of the categories for the things that weren't properly implemented um, until we actually have time to implement those. Um, so there's really quite a lot of stuff that's actually gone in here. We've now got these columns, um, and it's just a much, much more responsive application. We've got a, a window menu there, but that's um, going to change soon as well. That's a uh, small work that Jonathan has done um, on being able to select the particular boot that you're viewing. So previously, you can only use the, the, the single boot of the currently uh, running system. You can now go back and select, say, the last five boots or something like that um, and restrict to those. So that's much more useful for sort of post mortem diagnosis. In terms of what we're going to do in the future, there is a lot that can be done. It's still quite a small application. Um, I mean, I, I sort of try when I review to keep these patches patch size down. Um, so it takes a little bit of time, but it's, it's growing slowly. Um, we want to group um, log entries by application. Um, it's currently, or previously at least, has been difficult to actually group these things nicely. Um, often you'll get an application that will log 10 lines of, of uh, sort of spew all at once. Um, and that is something that is very, very difficult because as the consumer of that information, you know the timestamp on it, but you don't really know whether that's related. Is that 10 discrete errors? Is that 10 things that all correspond to the same thing? Um, so we're hoping to come up with some good heuristics about how we can uh, sort of compress those log entries down into one thing. Um, so that a lot of the time you'll get something like, say, a plugin for Firefox will be there and it will load and it will just output loads of crud at the beginning when it starts up. It would be nice to squash those down so that rather than having these 10 to 3 entries, you have just one. Um, it, it's pretty difficult, and I think the heuristics, mm, I, don't know, I don't know how reliable they're going to be. Um, we've done a little bit of work on it, a little bit of research, but we need to do a lot more there. Um, the, this, this application grouping is kind of tough um, because it depends on um, the, the launching process. So at the moment, the GNOME session is still launching um, the processes. Uh, in the, in the uh, user session, so when you click on a desktop file or something like that, um, often the GNOME session would still get all of the log messages for a particular application. This has been improved a lot. Colin Walters wrote uh, some nice code that uh, um, was kind of a quick hack, really, but actually make sure that um, each of these processes gets logged separately. Um, now he's kind of take advantage of that logs and actually group those together. 
um, message UUIDs. So this is an example of the structured metadata that I was talking about earlier. You can associate a UUID with each message. So there are UUIDs for things like when the system reboots, when a service has started, when a service has stopped. Um, there are 128 bits, so they're essentially unique and uh, any time you generate one. Um, you can add these yourself, so if you're a long-running demon, you might have a particular message for like, an income client connection or something like that. Um, we don't do anything with those at the moment in locks, we don't recognize those. Systemd has quite a few of these UUIDs that are kind of well-defined and, and well-known and used in several places. So we should really actually process those and display those differently in the event loop. Um, it's probably kind of a nice little hack to sort of do to just change the appearance of some of these log view items. Another thing that we don't yet do, um, and that is a lot harder actually, is message alerts. Uh, I mean, from the UI side, this is a relatively simple thing. You, know, you go through the logs, you're walking and it's running through, you come across a message that's interesting to you, and you give some notifications. So, say your hard disk is failing and there's a smart error, um, it would be nice to be able to monitor your logs and create some notification about that so that the user has at least some knowledge of what's going on. Um, however, that means that every time a log message comes into the journal, you've got all of that machinery going to get that message actually there, and then you have to then monitor that, pull it out again, process it all. So that can be quite heavy. What we'd really like to do, rather than, than doing that, having something running, running, but essentially polling all the time, is have Citadel tell us when something interesting happens. Um, we, I don't think the Citadel API for the journal reading actually has triggers yet. Um, and that's something that we've talked to the journal guys about. Um, they want to improve it, but it's probably something that we're going to have to do and help them with. Um, so we need to go into some system code. Um, another cool idea that uh, Tim Wo actually came up with, uh, who, uh, he's a guy who works on uh, lots of cup stuff, I think, lots of printing stuff. Uh, he thought it would be a cool idea to, out of these core dumps that you get put into the journal, um, pull those out, run them through GDB, and actually, um, one of the nice things about if you use a systemd logging APIs is you get um, the source code line of the particular um, statement where the log message was um, coming from your application. You actually get that included in, in the metadata that comes along the log message. So you could then, if you had the debug symbols for that installed, you could go and pull out the source code lines around that and say, yeah, well, you know, you have this assertion, you have this log message, and here is the source code. You're the developer, you can fix this. Um, he actually get, gave kind of a 300 line Python script proof of concept of this um, using GTK Source View to, to show all this. Which seemed pretty neat. Um, to get that into a, like, a nice workable state um, in log would probably be quite a bit of code. I mean, it could be quite a project to really make it nice. Um, but it's something that I think would be pretty cool for the future. Um, so I talked earlier about a lot of the problems that we have along where we have a lot of logging and as an example I put my system up here today and uh, just just sort of counted some lines really. Um, so 3,000 lines um, of log messages are generated when you start up a, a sort of standard known desktop um, running for Dora. Um, that is both user and system logs so it's not just like your kernel it's, it's also like everything that the, start, the session starts it's like the external all these sort of things. So a thousand of those lines are from the kernel. So a third of the log messages when you start up are from the kernel. Um, some of those you could probably slim down a bit, but really that's just like a one-off cost. Um, and it's like the kernel enumerating hardware, loading drivers, loading modules, probing things. Um, I'm not too worried about that because once the system's running, you don't really get very much of that anymore. If you plug something like a USB here, yeah, you get a few lines, but it's not, actually not a great deal. Um, so the kernel generally behaves pretty well. I mean, it'd be nice if that like ACPI dump at the beginning, which was like 100 lines of just random memory maps, which was not there, but it's probably really useful for kernel developers. And, I mean, we could pass like a silent flag and never see it, but I don't know, that's not really what bothers me. Um, 400 lines from XORG server startup. Yeah, that's a little bit annoying. Um, it's mostly 400 lines of, again, enumerating what hardware you have, like which monitors are connected, which video cards do you have. Um, a lot of it isn't super useful because it was probably from a time when we used to have a configuration file. So when it actually mattered, um, what of these messages, you know, when, when it mattered like screen one or screen zero and things. Nowadays, probably a lot of that isn't that useful, so we could probably get rid of a lot of that. Um, 150 lines from the user session. 
Um, so this is actually separate from that. It, it's things like applications starting up and uh, registering a well-known name on the, uh, the session manager setting it, so I see this one there. Not so useful, but then there aren't really a great deal of errors there. I mean, it, there are also um, other things like you will get assertions and things where I think GEM, there's, there's a bug where it tries to create a variant from a string which doesn't happen to be UTF-8, so there's a warning there. Um, and that's something that I would like to see fixed, all of these sort of warning messages essentially that just go, they persist for a very, very long time and never fixed. Uh, logs can hopefully help a little bit. And yeah, the remaining 1500 lines, that's from all the system humans. So that's like things starting up, telling you what they're doing. There are a lot of system demons, even now on a traditional, uh, on a, traditional, on a modern uh, desktop Linux system. I don't know. I still think 1,500 lines is, is way too many lines when you're starting up. I mean, that's more than the kernel, and the kernel interfaces with a lot of hardware. So I don't really see a great excuse for all those system demons to log that much. But that's probably a harder sell than fixing a desktop if we have more control over. So. Uh, one of the fun things that you get is uh, all your search providers, when they get loaded, you get told about all of those in your logs. Um, I don't know, maybe that's not so useful. Maybe we can come up with something a bit nicer there, just a list of all of them. But as I said, this is like each line of these is, is, just, is the line in the log. So you get a line for activating and a line for successfully activating. Great. Tracker. Well, we all love tracker. Um, yeah. SE Linux, well, we all hate SE Linux, so that's fine. Um, those are just some sort of examples that you've probably seen many times of the bad behavior that you really get with log messages. I mean, those, those are examples where you've got 20 or 30 lines, but really two or three would have been sufficient. Um, some of them we can fix, some of them are harder because they're not really what the developers are going to be developing. I mean, we should probably just file both against these misbehaving applications and these misbehaving subsystems and get it resolved because the amount of skew that you have there means it's actually difficult to zone in and figure out what is the problem and what is the thing that the developer is working on in particular but it needs to fix. Um, we've now got more tools to be able to do that. Logs is one of them. I mean, uh, it was kind of cool the first time I used it to actually debug something. Um, you know, I, I still use journal CTL a lot, but the filtering that works is, is pretty nice and it works works well. So I hope it can help um, people debug things. Um, the program errors that I've talked about, like this is uh, you know, UTF eight string not validating correctly, those are things I would I would really like to see fixed. Um, it might be easier to fix those if we actually take advantage of more of this structured logging, because at the moment the gene of logging stuff that I talked about earlier just logs as text like everything else. So you have to look for sort of those warning strings that, you know, you have this tracker warning here. Um, you still have to look for something that looks like it's coming from a GLib application in order to figure out where it is. Um, I've prototyped a, a log handler where it can actually log to the journal uh, directly um, from all of the standard uh, GLib logging code. Um, I think that would be kind of a nice thing to have. Um, maybe enabled by default, maybe not. Um, I've spoken to Ryan, the the maintainer about it, he's sort of positive about the idea. Doesn't like the idea of linking to system D. I mean, this goes back to the portability concern that I mentioned earlier that syslog is a very easy thing to depend on, <coughs> even for the BSDs and everything is completely fine. Um, probably if we start using journal APIs and GLIP, they're going to get a little bit annoyed. But on the other hand, it's probably something that we can isolate to some separate module or some optional feature. Um, and I mean, the log handler can be changed. Right. So it's something that can be patched out if they don't particularly like it and they can just use the traditional printf based one. It's fine. Um, yeah. If we take advantage of this structured logging in GLib, that will already help us get our platform in order. Um, and really then it's a case of getting more things uh, using this structured logging API. The kernel is still sort of improving in that regard. It used to be pretty bad and it's gotten better. You can get more information out of the kernel logs, like which device a particular log message was generated for, and things like that. Um, I think that will improve over time. Um, and now the system is kind of the de facto um, layer above the kernel, and I think that it's, it's more feasible to actually convince kernel developers that it's a good idea to make use of it. So we'll sort of kind of see how that goes with that. 
Um, so I'd just like to once again thank my uh, summer of trade students, uh, Rashi and Jonathan, um, and Lars for uh, helping out a lot with the, uh, the list model trade. Um, and thank you very much for listening.